You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome back into it. This is Locked On Balls, and I'm your host, Eric Kane. As always, thank you so much for making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day. Reminder, back half of the week, you know I'm on vacation, so I'm pre-recording this episode and doing a pretty good job of programming it. I don't believe any major breaking news is going to happen, but again, it's called breaking news for a reason. So uh, if something were to have broken late last night, you guys know that I'll uh, I'll be active on the Twitter and I'll catch you up as soon as I get back. But uh, in honor of being on vacation, thought I'd bring on our guy, John Garcia, uh, director of recruiting for SI. We uh, we welcomed John on to our show uh, a couple weeks ago and did an awesome job talking recruiting. So I thought we'd talk a little bit more recruiting here today. John, thanks so much for for your time, man. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yeah, there's there's always plenty to talk about with the Vols these days. So happy to do it. For sure, always. I never, regardless of any sports, never a dull <laughs> moments on Rocky Top. Um, Big news earlier this week, Tennessee gets some help via the transfer portal in defensive back Andre Turrentine. Now he's a Nashville kid, went to Innsworth uh, in, in the mid-state. Jeremy Pruitt didn't necessarily recruit him that much, goes on to Ohio State, but a former four-star, uh, didn't play much as a freshman, believe he redshirted, was very active up there this spring. He is coming home, in a sense, uh, to Tennessee, and, and that's a good thing for Tennessee because, as we know, that defensive backfield needs a lot of help. Yeah, and it never hurts to bring in some versatility, especially with a guy, like you mentioned, who's from the state. So certainly from an, an objectivity standpoint or from an optical standpoint, you you understand why Andre was brought in to UT, and he's got something to prove, right? A guy who, you know, you, you don't go to a big-time school and expect to sit. You know, it's not something – it's it happens every year, but it's not something you expect. So you would imagine he's got something to prove in coming back home yeah. to play – SEC football. But what I like about this get is that he's versatile, right? You can line him up at nickel, which is basically a starter these days. Uh, Safety is probably the safest place for him to play, but he might have some corner upside as well, depending on how he's developed in the last year at Ohio State. Did he add to the lower body explosiveness? Can he run a little bit better than he did in high school? Maybe corner is a possibility, but surely safety, maybe even nickel, which is so important. You know, he does bring a physicality to the game that is necessary. He's got two-way experience dating back to high school, so you know the ball skills are there as well. And Endsworth, uh, as you mentioned, Eric, I mean, one of the top programs in, in Tennessee and in the South, so you know he's coached up as well. So a guy who you expect to hit the ground running and help, uh, like you said, a group that absolutely needs it. Yeah, Tennessee also gained the commit going back to the prep level now. This is last week. And a four-star defensive back, Sylvester Smith, a guy from Mumford, Alabama, a very, very talented. I love his tape, fell in love with his tape, kind of breaking down this prospect. And, um, you know, he's a top, you know, 100 player, depending on where you look and where you shop in your windows. But one of the better players out of the state of Alabama. And, you know, obviously won't be here this fall. Uh, it's class of 2023. But uh, another defensive uh, addition for Josh Heupel here in this class of 2023 to where – you know all the all the praise about Nico on the offensive side and, and the potential there, but you know, Josh Heupel stacking up a lot of these uh, a lot of these blue chippers on the on the defensive side of the ball as well. Yeah, a big fan of Sylvester Smith. I mean, there's really no other way to put it. That sophomore tape can stack up to anybody's uh, in the secondary in the class of 2023. And I think when we look back on this one, Eric, we're going to be like, wow, like Tennessee was smart to get in early and smart to stay with it because he got banged up last year. And some schools fell in and out of this conversation, but Tennessee was always consistent in, in recruiting Sylvester. And that's something that paid off because LSU under Brian Kelly and that transition staff really made a run at him. And there was that one small point where you're like, hey, LSU's going to either prolong this recruitment or upset Tennessee uh, in it. But obviously Tennessee holds them off and gains the early verbal commitment. Uh, and Sylvester is one of those kids that wants to be done with the process. And I think that's important uh, because I do think in this off season and during the season, his profile will rise to the point where you wonder, I mean, Auburn was in it, but like, Hey, where's Bama in this conversation? You know that that's going to come up at some point. So to get him in early to prioritize him early and land the recruitment or land the commitment, I think says a lot uh, about where Tennessee is. And, and like I said, six months from now, we'll look back on this and say, this was a huge get in this class for Tennessee because I think his his star will only continue to rise and rankings, however you want to quantify it, 
I think that's all on the up and up because he's a versatile player. He's a, an explosive prospect who, again, brings you some versatility. I know this is something we, we just talked about with Turin time, but that is important when you're talking about secondary players because there are at least five starters. In a lot of cases, you've got six DBs on the field in the pass-first nature of, of college football. So to get someone who can maybe move around says a lot. He's healthy now. He, he's back to full speed. And, again, I, I think this offseason and certainly during the season – other people and programs are going to say, wait a minute, like we need to double check on this kid because he can absolutely play. He's a, an explosive, explosive athlete uh, who's only getting better technically. So big fan of him now. And, and I think where his game's going. Yeah, it's it's weird. You're, you're seeing it at the, at the college level, but also in the NFL, more dime, more and more dime. Le- it hurts me. Less linebackers on the field, more DBs and I mean, I think that's a big reason why Alante Taylor got picked so early with the Saints because you recognize the the abilities, the speed, the coverage skills and all that. And even if you put Alante Taylor maybe inside in, in that Dennis Allen scheme to where he's protected with more safety help over the top and linebackers underneath and all that, that might kind of add a little bubble for him to go and play that slot nickel. And so, um, you know, maybe that's a position for Sylvester Smith or for, for turn time as well kind of moving forward because you're right, that is the direction – uh, of football moving forward uh, defensively. Uh, back to the portal. I probably should have put these two together, but the bad programming on me. Uh, feels like you and I were joking. Tennessee's been on Brew McCoy watch for quite some time, right? Um, I do believe that you know Tennessee will eventually land a wide receiver. If it is Brew McCoy, you know, what would he bring to the University of Tennessee? Obviously, you're losing Javonta Payton. You're losing Bayless Jones, who's now with the Bears. Uh, Tennessee needs a wide receiver. What would a Brew McCoy, if he elects to come to Tennessee, bring uh, to that Josh Heupel offense? Just a whole lot of size and length. I mean, you really can't have enough of that. Again, we just talked about the nature of the game moving towards a pass first one. It's already there. Let's not say moving towards. It's already here. So the, the variety of targets uh, that can factor into the passing game are, are really important. And Brew goes, what, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, extremely long prospect out of modern day. Was, was a little bit more raw coming out of high school to where – in the projection department, we were kind of back and forth on a couple different positions, uh, but I think now he's settled in on the offensive side of the ball. The kid has been through a lot, so you expect maturity uh, to come out of it on this side of it, and you also expect motivation to come on this side of it. Whenever he does finally end up at Tennessee, I agree with you, Eric. I think it's a matter of, of when and not if. Uh, a lot of T's to cross, I's to dot in that in that process, which is often the case uh, in the transfer portal. Uh, but Brew McCoy has got a ton of ability he can really run, particularly uh, from a vertical perspective. Uh, and again, that catch radius with that length really enables for you to have a larger margin for error whenever uh, you know there is a mistake or pressure, something you deal with a ton uh, in the SEC in particular. So I just think he offers uh, a boundary skill set, a red zone skill set that every team needs. Uh, you can't always rely on the tight end uh, to, to create that presence and pull defenders. So now when you can do it in the boundary and on the outside, it opens things up a little bit more for the slot types, the running backs. We know, you know, Hypo likes to utilize those guys in the passing game. Now it just opens things up just a little bit more. And, and worst case scenario gives gives Hooker a red zone target or a sideline target to to manipulate. You know, I thought that was going to be Cedric Tillman's role last year because when we were at some of those early uh, practices for fall camp, you know, last August, I kept seeing them work the ball to Tillman in the red zone and. You know, lo and behold, he became one of the best receivers in the SEC. So I, the skill set's perfect for what Hypel wants on the outside. And if they can get Jalen Hyatt or somebody just to step up in the slot to replace Bayless Jones, uh, that would be uh, good for Tennessee. But we are off and rolling with John Garcia. He's going to stick around for this entire show. We're going to talk recruiting. We're going to talk some more uh, transfer portal um, you know, potential additions, some departures. Uh, we're going to look at the big board and talk about Tennessee, where its next step is, and the, and the prep recruiting for the class of 2023, all that and more. So stick around here on Locked On Balls. BetOnline.net, it's your number one source for all your sports stats and informational needs. Find all the latest sports developments, the league news, league reviews, including this year's basketball playoffs and the starts, of course, of Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting, playoffs, esports. You guys know reality television is there as well. You know, we're we got the weekend coming up, right? It's Thursday. And you know, what happens every Thursday? Well, you're gonna have some primetime sports action going on. You know, the, the playoffs are happening right now, baseball's happening, NASCAR on Sunday. You have golf this weekend. Put your sports knowledge to use to put some coin in your pocket. Help yourself out, and you can do it all at betonline.net. So, how do you do it? Well, 
You head on over to that website, that's betonline.net, or you can use your mobile device and learn about more of the latest trends and all the action. Get in on that action and win you some coin. Betonline.net, it is where the game starts. Back here on Locked On Vols, your Thursday edition. I'm your host, Eric Kane, and today we are joined by John Garcia. John, I got to say, man, some great reviews when you joined the show first and foremost. And I know oh, oh. I know the, the Locked On College hosts are a big fan of yours, so you must be doing something well. I appreciate it. No, it's been fun. It's been fun dipping into different fan bases and, and talking different topics. It's not all NIL and the portal, but uh, a lot of it is. But it, it's fun. It's fun. It's it's such a different deal when you go to different parts of the country. Uh, you know, I'm from down south, so talking SEC ball is, is always kind of at the top of my list. Big topic this week in college uh, college football. Um, the situation going on with Jordan Addison, Pittsburgh, Southern Cal. You brought it up there, so I thought I'd just mention it. The word yeah. tampering is being thrown out there. You got Pat Narduzzi reportedly calling Lincoln Riley a couple of times. I mean, you know, it, it, we know this is happening, right? We know this has been a part of college football for a while. For it to be out in the public, you know, as it's been the last couple of days, it's it's kind of it, – I don't want to say it's mind-blowing because it's not as expected, but still when it happens, it's kind of like, whoa, uh, this is kind of the direction we're going, right? Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that you have no choice but to acknowledge, uh, especially in that direction, like you said. And, and yeah, it, it is certainly expected, but – I don't know. It being so public just makes sense. I mean, that's college football. And who like who refutes that Pat Narduzzi called Lincoln Riley? That absolutely happened. It's in the personality of, of him. I mean, imagine losing, potentially losing, I should say, a Bolitnikoff Award winner who's coming back after you brought in, ironically enough, a USC quarterback transfer to steady that ship and, and really contend. I mean, you could make the argument that Pitt has a higher outlook in 2022 then USC, you know, all things eat. And so it is It is fascinating. It's kind of the last frontier to me of the reasons we've seen kids go into the portal in theory, right? Obviously, disgruntled player, wants to play more somewhere else, makes sense. Injury, medical retirement, but I still want to play, has to be somewhere else, makes sense. Family circumstance, you got to go home, something like that, that makes sense. Or, you know, on the other extreme, like, okay, tight position battle, but you lose it makes sense to, to go and look forward to something else like Spencer Rattler, something we saw just, just happen at Baylor um, with, with that quarterback situation. But then you have this, the guy who's in theory the best at his position in the sport, who's set up to have a great follow-up year to that, uh, then elect to go in. And, and, and then the X factor, the icing on the cake is the potential tampering and like, hey, this thing was in place before he even hit the portal. I mean, that's where it hits another level. And I think that was the breaking point for a lot of people around the sport. Like, Hey, it's time to say something. It's time to do something, but how in the world do you even one prove it or two kick off that entire process of change? What, what does that even look like? Because we're still early in the portal era, just a couple of years and we're less than one year into the NIL era. So it is, it is really fascinating in, in how the two are beginning to overlap, but obviously Eric, it's not something that's going away. A lot of changes in college football, for sure. And I believe they're changes for the better. But again, when you have them back-to-back, it's just that's why a lot of the old-timers are just hating where college athletics is going right now. And you can't really blame them because – and I'm not, I'm not trying to stereotype. It's it, it could be from different you know forms of life and different ages and all that. But when you have those two changes back-to-back, it's, I mean, it's a lot, to be completely honest. Uh, we'll move on back to recruiting. Let's go down to IMG Academy. Tennessee very much in it for wide receiver five-star Carnell Tate. And now, first, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna need you to help me with his name because I've not learned to pronounce his name correctly. But it's a four star offensive tackle, Francis. What we got? I, I go Maliaga. That's me. Uh, Sounds I, good I interviewed to me. him. I interviewed him and asked him, and I can't find the audio of it. But I'm like, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep looking for it. We will get it right before my run with you is done. Uh, however, <laughs> however many more times we got to do this, we're gonna get it right before it counts. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I, I got Nico down in November, and then I forgot it in December, and then I, I, I learned it in January because <laughs> it, it looked more and more real like he was coming here, but we'll get him down. But as for that four-star off at the tackle, kind of a new name that's emerged in it for Tennessee. Tennessee looking for long, lengthy, athletic tackles. Uh, I think he's a guy that could also slide inside if you needed him to, um, th- this being Francis. But, you know, he and Carnell Tate, two big-time targets for Tennessee down there in Bradenton, Florida. Yeah, both guys who who really have been national recruits since before they got to IMG, and that is only reemphasized 
uh, how coveted they they have become. Yeah, there's obviously a ton of Carnell smoke to Tennessee conversations going on, uh, and and those IMG guys keep up with each other. You know, they know, hey, if I want to go to this school, I need to visit with this guy, uh, and that's kind of becoming the conversation between Francis and Carnell. Uh, to my understanding, there is a potential visit window at the end of May. It's like well, it's like a cookout. There's there's a, one of these off season events going down uh, in Knoxville, and and maybe that's when Francis finally gets on campus and once you get that point to that point it's kind of off to the races because he's made it a point to see places he really hasn't experienced under the current coaching staff this year he's been to florida a ton miami usc oregon all coaches and and programs that are early into that transition but he's never really been consideration considering tennessee so I, i think that's where this kind of comes out of left field but when you talk to the kid, you know, he's on a very slow timeline. He really wants to take everything in. So it's a great opportunity for Tennessee to sort of crash this party. Uh, and we do we do have some precedent of IMG kids keeping an eye on each other and maybe starting to follow to a school that starts to trend. And, and we know what the Nico commitment did for Tennessee on a national scale. Yes, there's some NIL implications that I'm sure are, are, are happening in that IMG locker room. And Carnell's so familiar now that he could kind of sell it, you know, before Francis ever sets up the trip. Uh, So I'm curious to see, obviously, how Carnell's recruitment starts to go down. It does appear that he's much closer than Francis in particular to making a decision. And I think if and when that happens, that will make things a lot clearer. But but look, I think if if he visits at the end of May, all all bets are off in terms of trying to figure out who is is really in the running for Francis. Because, I mean, when you start to visit schools that aren't even in your, your top group, it really opens the door for for a recruitment almost resetting and starting over. And I think in a lot of ways, after the carousel action we saw last year, that's how a lot of elites are approaching the process altogether. Yeah, and you know, Cornell Tate is very much a real possibility for Tennessee. I thought Kyler Casper would be the the more um pr- I guess the the easier one of the two to get to Knoxville, but he elects to obviously not go to Tennessee, go to Oregon and reclassify. So Carnot Tate's very much in the. I mean, they love they loved them both. I think it was a situation to where you knew you weren't getting both for sure, um, and, and so you know Nico is also being a big time recruiter in that aspect uh, as well. Um, real quick, the cornerback board for Tennessee, you know, getting a lot of you know, picking up some offensive linemen, and there's a lot of offensive linemen talk. Of course, you know, some wide receivers here and some linebackers that's picking up. Uh, but cornerback, you know, Christian Conyers has been at the top of the board for Tennessee for quite some time, you know, dating back to his freshman season, um, even before the change of the uh, the coaching staff for Josh Heupel. And, and, you know, they picked up right kind of where the Pruitt administration left off with him. Bowling Green, Kentucky, going to come down between Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, Tony Mitchell, a one-time Tennessee commit way back when, before he even Throwback. played a high school snap. Uh, Tennessee's... Yeah moving back into that one it's still probably a long shot but there's there and then a guy that i spoke on a couple of times and, and the audience here on lock on balls knows this name so we don't have to spend much time on him but uh, brandon strozier from st francis in georgia tennessee was sitting pretty there for a long time and then i think clemson's really making a run here so it'll be interesting to see which one between tennessee and clemson uh, he elects but as far as conyer and, and mitchell conyer is obviously the, the more realistic option i think tennessee's in pretty good shape there but Gosh, if you'd able to get back in it with Tony Mitchell, that'd be huge for uh, Tim Banks and Willie Martinez. Yeah, I mean, with Kanye, look, it's 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 a coin flip battle. You mentioned uh, it's the in-state uh, Wildcats and UT. So you could really see that one going either way. I, I do think that there is something to be said, and, and similar with Conyers and Mitchell, where when you start getting recruited by multiple coaching staffs at one school, I really think it reemphasizes inadvertently how much of a priority you are. And I think there is some staying power with that. I've, I've heard that at Tennessee. I've heard that at Oregon, Miami, a couple other schools that have gone through changes over the last couple of years. Uh, so I do think there is some some strengths there. Um, obviously, the in-state poll is what it is. But Kentucky's been, you know, kind of 500 with, with those type of recruits that are true SEC guys in-state. You know, they've kept some, and, and they were very notable in nature, but they've lost out on some of those big battles as well but what you talked about at the top of the show eric the need in the secondary i think could lean things tennessee's way uh and and when it comes to tony mitchell man that's one of the last kids i thought we would hear talk about you know being on one administration all in and then kind of not involved with the other but here comes tennessee uh, you know back in the race for him totally different situation so many other schools involved for him you know 
Alabama, Auburn, Georgia. I mean, a and it was like the surging school before Tennessee got back into the race. So that that is a much more, to me, longstanding recruitment. I think we'll get the other decision a little bit sooner. But the fact that Tennessee's even back in the conversation is a big deal with Tony Mitchell. And I think, again, it reemphasizes the point that this thing is, is not regional. It's national. This is a big deal. Tennessee is going to contend for big-time recruits. Uh, and, and like you said, it, it – it is kind of the lazy way to look at it. Like, well, yeah, of course, on offense, NIL and Nico and Hypo and da da da. But now look at all these defensive recruits that are again national that keep bringing up the Vols when you talk to them. And and I think in the state of Alabama in particular, where of course you just got Smith, uh, now you start to pile on uh, some prospects, and and that stuff starts to spread. And I think. With Tony Mitchell, he wants to continue to take visits, obviously. Now, if he shows up at the end of May, now all of a sudden you're saying, okay, this thing is is really real. So I think with Conyers, Vols fans are just looking at uh, sooner the better for a commitment date. With Mitchell, just watch that that end-of-the-month barbecue. If he gets to, to that cookout uh, on campus, game on. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing with Francis. I mean, two truly national recruits uh, at, a, at a big position of need. So – Things are trending up overall. I think that's the theme with, with Tennessee. Uh, the perception today versus six months ago versus 12 months ago is, is a long way away from where it was. Yeah, the cookout that John keeps referencing here, it's, they're calling it the the premier showcase, essentially. Okay. It's the cookout, okay. Memorial Day. Um, if you are... I mean, if you're in it, if you if Tennessee if Tennessee wants you, you're going to be there, and so they're really putting an emphasis on. It. Of course, there'll be some 2024s and and so on and so forth, but that's going to be a big one. So I would agree. Getting Tony Mitchell there. And funny story, real quick, I is like I just started covering recruiting a little bit, kind of on a part time role. Just a couple stories here, you know, a couple story, two stories here and there every other week. And like the first couple of weeks, like Tony Mitchell committed to Tennessee, and I I turned to my superior and I'm like, this kid's like in eighth grade, is that normal? And he's like. <laughs> Well, not exactly. I wouldn't say it's normal, but it happens in the world of recruiting. So uh would be interesting if that comes full circle. Hey, we're going to have more with John coming up. It's a fantastic conversation. What about support, potential entries in via the portal versus um, some some portal departures, attrition in a program, and how the, how the transfer portal helps to overcompensate from those losses? Obviously, it's a big way. Uh, all that and more, plus a couple more looks at some position uh, rankings and uh, you know who's who the balls are in it for at those certain positions. More coming up here on Locked On Balls with John Garcia. It's still a good Thursday, everybody. Thank you so much for making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day. Got the weekend coming up. I know you're looking forward to that. And we are talking recruiting here on Locked On Balls with the director of recruiting for SI. His name is John Garcia. Hey, John, Tennessee's had some departures, and I wouldn't call them big losses, but at the time, they were some big time, you know, recruits that Jeremy Pruitt brought into the program prior to Josh Heupel. Look at Aaron Willis. Uh, he was a four star linebacker from St. Francis Academy. Look at James Robinson. He was a four star offensive lineman. Julian Nixon was a four star receiver, but he was always going to be a tight end. None of those guys were, you know, really even second string right now, but they had projections of being depth guys and guys that could contribute sooner or later. It's just the nature of the beast, right? If you're not getting PT, you're going to head to that portal. And now that opens up more spots for Tennessee, who I believe is going to be very active in the portal, already was earlier this week and, and you know, got some spots to fill throughout the summer. You have to be. Like you said, it is the nature of the beast. And I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for roster additions here in the offseason. You know, the May 1st deadline has come and gone. So not all the names are public yet in terms of who's actually in the portal, but the paperwork has has literally had to be done by this point. So you do expect Tennessee to become a little bit more active with certain positions. And I think the trenches are always a focus uh, when you deal with attrition. It, it, look, it is the SEC, right? I mean, the schedule is as brutal and tough as any conference in college football, probably more so in the SEC. So you expect some mobility there. Uh, but you also have to consider this, and I think Amarius Mims taught us this, you always have to consider the fact that maybe some of these guys can come back to the program because the portal is not a friendly place for a lot of prospects. I think the stat that came out last week was 43% of the kids who hit the portal in football don't come out of it. You know, they, they're in that portal purgatory where, you know, there's just not enough spots at some of these schools. So uh, I do think that's something to consider as well. Maybe a guy or two from this list could, could end up back in Knoxville. But usually 
it does mean that they're moving on, uh, but it's a part of the game. Every single school is dealing with it, whether you're the national champs to, to the worst team in the FBS. So it's just a part of it, uh, but you expect the schools that recruit well from the prep ranks and the JUCO ranks to certainly do so through the transfer portal, and we've seen that thus far at UT. So listen to this, man. And, of course, it's because of coaching turnover. I mean, last, you know, right before Heupel came with Jeremy Pruitt leaving, oh, man, it got ugly. It got really, really ugly. Uh, listen to some of these stats right here. This is from one of my coworkers, Austin Price of Um, You know, 2021, 19 signed, 11 gone. 2020, 23 signed, 9 have gone. 2019, 23 signed, 15 have gone. 2019, 23 were signed. 15 are not in the program any longer. Um, that's an extreme case, okay? That that That's Tennessee. It's not like that everywhere else, and hopefully that's not the norm moving forward, obviously. But having the transfer portal is going to help overcompensate for all of that, and, and that's why Tennessee suffered with depth last year. It's why you played three linebackers and two of which shouldn't have even saw, saw the field. It's why you had two safeties that couldn't come off the field even though they needed a breather a lot because they were slow and getting beat. Since he had no depth last year, it'll be a little bit better this fall. But the transfer portal is helping overcompensate for, for issues just like that. I mean, you know, Tennessee's been hit the hardest via the departures. You know, Henry Tuoltuo, Corvairs Crouch, Eric Gray. I mean, this is all last offseason. And um, it, it's starting to show up kind of right now. Yeah, and it's understandable. I mean, you you – Again, from a from an idealistic standpoint, yes, all of these kids bleed, you know, orange. Go big orange, right? I mean, it's it's not that simple. You're committing to people. You're committing to coaches. And it's something that fan bases hate to hear, but it is the truth. These are the coaches that are recruiting you. So when there is a change at the top, naturally, you're going to at least consider moving on. And we saw if you add up those numbers from those classes that, that your colleague put together, I mean, it's like 40 guys, 45 guys. So – that, that's that's half a roster, you know, 85 scholarship players. So that is certainly something that is happening throughout college football because it's a people business. You know, the, the branding that we love and 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 that fans you know pile in for, it's not it's not reflected in, in recruiting or in the transfer portal. It's about an individual opportunity and oftentimes one coach, much less a group of coaches, one coach that has that impact. Uh, but it does come back around, and as you mentioned, the portal. Uh, can give it and take it away. Uh, it will give. It will give to a school like Tennessee. I think perceptionally people understand it's on the up and up. The SEC East beyond Georgia seems wide open right now. Uh, and you're in the SEC. I mean, how many – you talk to recruits, Eric. How many kids say it's the SEC? It's it's the best conference in them. college football. So I am interested in whatever – I mean, Vanderbilt gets that, right? I mean, so it's like it, that stuff matters in recruiting. So – it will in turn matter in the transfer portal, but it's the nature of the beast. And, and, and again, that's part of the reason why the, the year on the field that Tennessee had in 2021 was so amazingly surprising, like on a positive front, because you, you could understand if it was a two and 10 kind of campaign based on attrition, based on how abruptly the Pruitt era came to an end and the timing of it all, it would have made sense. It would have been very understandable. And that's why I think the overachievement of 21 has led to a lot of optimism looking into 22. John, last thing I got for you, man. This has been a fun once again. Let's look at – go back to the class of 2023. Let's look yeah. at the running back field for Tennessee. Some names. We don't have to hit on every single one of them, but Trayon Webb, I believe he is you know, all but not coming to Tennessee, but he, you know, Tennessee's in it for him. You got Roderick Robinson, who is, a Californ- who is in San Diego, but not necessarily a California kid. He's been all, all across the country a little bit. Uh, Dante Dowdle from Mississippi. Jeremiah Caldwell – or Jeremiah Cobb, excuse me. Um, you've got, uh, you know, Sam Singleton, uh, you know, even Deshaun Bishop right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's some of the names at running back. Uh, Tennessee ne- likes to play three to four running backs. Tennessee didn't have that last year, especially with, the uh, you know, Tyon Evans being hurt and, uh, you know, Jabari Small being hurt. They're never playing at the same time. But what do you, what do you see with Tennessee in this, uh, this class of 2023s and, and the caliber of the, of the back that they can bring in? Yeah, I see some versatile type of, of backs. I mean, some, some big power backs that are very much one-cut downhill runners. Trayon Webb fits that. Uh, I think Dowdle coming out of Mississippi fits that uh, as well. I mean, that one's probably Ole Miss, UT battle, Webb. Like you said, it's like don't follow him on Twitter because if regardless of fan base, you're going to feel good. South Carolina, Florida, Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, everyone's felt good at one point. He's made multiple commitments already. Um, you know, he's a great kid, a fun kid who understands his value. And, and I think he's going to continue to play to that until 
he makes a commitment. But I do think Tennessee and Florida, probably the top two in, in that conversation. South Carolina is, is the sleeper for sure. Um, and then Jeremiah Cobb's interesting, you know, a counter to those types. Uh, I think he's great out of the backfield, very, very fast uh, in space, a guy who certainly fits that modern mold of, of what you think in terms of you know, catching the football out of the backfield. Obviously, he's an instinct kid for the Auburn Tigers. They're all in on him. He's a Montgomery kid. They have to do well in Montgomery, so they are prioritizing him as well as anyone. But, you know, Clemson is, is, is in the conversation, Tennessee has factored in and hosted him a couple of times to this point. Uh, so I do think that recruitment is going to have a little bit more drama than maybe geography uh, suggests. Uh, so that's one I'd keep a close eye on from a Vols fan, especially as some of these decisions come in a little bit sooner. I think Dowd will probably be the first one to come off the board. I think he's got a commitment date uh, in the next week or two. So that one will, will kind of offset some of these other ones, uh, but certainly a lot of names to keep an eye on. But what strikes me about that list you gave me, Eric, a lot of different style of running back. So it looks like Tennessee's trying to pair a little bit of thunder and lightning together to, to, to fit the SEC mold. John Garcia, the director of recruiting for SI. Uh, we did it again, man. That's fun. It's it's fun to just talk uh, talk a little shop with recruiting there for about thirty minutes. Um, what you what you got coming up? You know the the work uh, on your side. The what you what you uh, working on here lately that we can look forward to reading. Man, it's all about the quarterback dominoes. Tennessee's got theirs, and it's all good. But uh, there's a lot of quarterback dominoes still to sort out. A ton of impacts uh, in the SEC. So curious about Arch Manning, Jaden Rashad. Arch Manning, the Notre Dame. Uh, Is that right? <laughs> the, uh, Eli and Peyton. Yes, Arch, not so much. Uh, yeah, that was a fun, a fun uh, Twitter storm to put out uh, the other day. Yeah, it's it's never a dull moment with quarterback recruiting, and and that's why we're talking Tennessee so much because they got one of the best. John Garcia, man, I appreciate it. We'll do it again soon. Okay. Sounds good, Eric. Thanks for having me. All right. The director of recruiting, football recruiting for Sports Illustrated, John Garcia. Always appreciative of his time, and he will certainly be back here on Locked On Balls. That's going to do it. You guys who love recruiting, boy, you were you were in heaven today, right? Uh, that was a whole lot of fun for me, too, just going down the list and naming off prospect and targets and all that type of stuff. That was fun. So I hope you enjoyed it as well, and I hope we got a better picture of kind of the direction of the class uh, that uh, Tennessee is going in here for the class of 2023. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, we are done here on a Thursday. We got one more show left. That's coming up tomorrow on a Friday. Logan Ward will join me. And uh, thank you, as always, for making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day. Hey, go ahead and give Locked On SEC a listen. Chris Gordy, or a watch on YouTube, Chris Gordy, uh, Sports 790 in Houston, does a fantastic job. He gets, I say this, and I, I'm not just saying this, it's not a read that I'm reading. This is all just, just me talking. He gets some of the greatest interviews uh, from around the SEC, from players to coaches to analysts, all that type of stuff. Give that stuff a listen if you're an SEC fan overall. Of course, after Locked On Balls, your first listen. Make Locked On SEC your second listen each and every day. Guys, appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow and enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody.